Welcome. If you haven't got coffee or cookies, you should. They're not going to last forever. Uh, my name's Benjamin Perryman, and I'm uh, one of the Shulik. I you can't hear me. Even with my lecture voice, you can't hear me at the back. I can use the mic, but then I can't wander around. Can you hear me at the back? No. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah, tethered to the mic. Uh, I'm uh, one of the Schulich Fellows here at the Schulich School of Law, and I teach contract law here. And I'm also a doctoral candidate at Yale Law School, where I'm studying happiness and constitutional law, which is the subject of my talk tonight. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to see so many friendly faces in the audience. I'm going to talk tonight for about 45 minutes and then leave 45 minutes for questions afterward. You're here for the talk. I'm here for the questions, primarily. Uh, and so I hope to pique your interest enough to provoke some conversation after the talk. But b before I proceed, I just want to give a disclaimer. My research is uh, quite multidisciplinary. It touches on philosophy, economics, psychology, neuroscience. I'm not any of these things. There's a good chance that uh, there's people in the audience that know way more about these topics than me. And I would encourage you to uh, interject or save your uh, questions till the end uh, to, to keep me honest or to push back if you think I've gone too far. But regardless of your background, it should be obvious uh, as I go through my talk that I'm quite interested in your subjective perspective on happiness, that I think that's very important. Uh, and so I would encourage you, though I'm not going to employ the Socratic method, to, to share that uh, in the conversation that follows. So my talk is going to proceed in three parts. Uh, the first part's a discussion uh, about the purpose of law, quite abstract. Uh, the second part will be an explanation of what some have called the science of happiness. This is this emerging body of social science research out of the fields I just mentioned. And then the last part is going to be a discussion of how we might take this information from the science of happiness and apply it to constitutional cases. So my ultimate claim tonight, uh, and what I'll argue, is that the fundamental purpose of law is to create the type of society that we want to live in. And from my perspective, that type of society is a happy society. It's a society where, where the needs and aspirations of all persons find recognition and protection in the law, especially those persons who are most marginalized. And if that's correct, then this emerging research on what makes humans happy or unhappy ought to be incorporated into legal decision making. So part one, what is the purpose of law? This might seem like an easy question to answer. Uh, it's not. Much ink spilled uh, on this question. But I just want to start with this guiding legal maxim around which I think there is wide support. And that is that all law is created for the benefit of human beings. There's been some expansion of this idea recently to include other sentient beings, but I think it still holds that the purpose of law is for the benefit of human beings. It's created by human beings for human beings. How do we know, then, whether or not the law is actually achieving this benefit? So what I'd like to give is a very selective and one slide rendition of 225 years of legal thought. Because this notion that happiness and law are linked or ought to be linked is not new. And if you go back in time to the late 18th century, you'll find thinkers that thought the two concepts were uh, closely linked. And the first person I'll go to is this fellow named Jeremy Bentham, who's a bit of an odd duck. Uh, he was a lawyer, and he's one of the most influential legal theorists of our time. But he didn't want to be a lawyer. He was, he was uh, dragged kicking and screaming into the law by his father. What he really wanted to do was to become a scientist, and instead he became a lawyer. Throughout his career, uh, he was not a successful lawyer, but he was a successful legal thinker. And uh, 
his concern or his hate for law and lawyers uh, was that we have a tendency to use words, uh, symbols, and have the ability to move them around to suit our clients' interests in ways that might not comport with justice, but can be very convincing to the right ears. He called this the tyranny of words. And his concern was that a lot of words lawyers use are not actually for the benefit of all humans, but are in fact for the benefit of their clients to the detriment of others. He developed this idea that we should be have some type of metric to know when a law is for the benefit of the general public and when it is not. And he keyed in on these notions of pleasure and pain that he says nature has placed humankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure, and argued that we should evaluate laws and their benefit on their ability to maximize pleasure for the greatest number of people and minimize pain. Around the same time, the Declaration of Independence in the US was signed, and it said that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This led Jefferson to say, from his perspective, the only orthodox object of the institution of government is to secure the greatest degree of happiness possible to the general mass of those associated under it. And yet, 225 years later, this is not how we think of government, nor how we generally think of law. But this idea that happiness is linked to law hasn't completely disappeared. And what I found interesting uh, in reading Pierre Elliott Trudeau's memoirs is what he thought the purpose of constitutional law was. In talking about the Charter, he said, the subject of law must be the individual human being. The law must permit the individual to fulfill himself or herself to the utmost. That was what Pierre Trudeau thought the Charter was supposed to do. That's not where legal thought has gone. So I would submit that the two main objectives in Canadian law, if we were to look for some theory that ties Canadian cases together. It's two objectives, wealth maximization and human rights. And that some combination of these two objectives is what most Canadian legal thinkers would tell you amounts to justice. The wealth maximization part takes off uh, in conjunction with our move uh, to capitalism, to global capitalism. It comes as part of this rejection of, of Bentham's work that we have no ability to actually measure what makes people happy until recently. And so we should be looking for something else to quantify uh, the benefit. And that, that something else is wealth. At the same time, in the post-World War II environment, both domestically and internationally, we see the spread of human rights uh, and while there may be some pushback to wealth maximization today, uh, human rights are almost sacrosanct. Come in, there are seats back there, down here, grab a coffee, grab a cookie. Um, I don't have a problem with either wealth maximization or human rights as goals of, legal, of the legal system. I think uh, they are both worthy goals. My complaint or my critique tonight it is how law is interpreted and applied in the name of wealth and human rights. So one of these tensions that we always have is, should we evaluate the law based on how it's written or how it's interpreted, applied, and experienced? Some will say that you should evaluate law as it's written, that you need not be concerned with its interpretation and application, that we try to get the law uh, as good as it can be, um, and that we're not concerned necessarily with the interpretation or application process. I tend to fall into this second camp, that you can't evaluate law without also asking uh, what is the economic, political, and social environment in which law operates. 
What might be a good law on paper can be a bad law in practice, both from the perspective of whether it actually achieves what it's intended to do and from the perspective of whether it has unintended consequences on certain elements of society. There's been this push recently within uh, the legal uh, industry, at least, to expand access to justice. It's a reality that most Canadians cannot afford and have no access to a lawyer unless you're exceptionally wealthy or exceptionally poor. But if you ask people what access to justice means to them, many people will respond that it's something more than getting into court. It's not just that you have a day, a day in court to make your point. It's about uh, whether or not the law creates this type of society in which we want to live. Part of the reason why it often doesn't, especially for certain marginal groups, is something that Roberto Unger, who's a Brazilian uh, now politician, former uh, Harvard law prof, calls rationalizing legal analysis. And his argument is that uh, law as it's practiced by lawyers and law as it's taught in law schools has one main purpose, and that purpose is to rationalize the status quo. That the very essence of law is, is to inhibit change and is to find uh, principled reasons to explain what currently exists without questioning whether or not there's some ideological structure already present in the law. This rationalization is in part a product of the fact that we use precedent in the common law system, so we're bound by previous rules. It's also a product of the position that lawyers and judges uh, believe they should hold in society, which is not necessarily as change agents. And it's, I would suggest, a product of the character traits of the folks that go into law, some of whom are quite creative, uh, others of whom are less so. <laughs> um, and what this means is that when the law changes, if the law changes, and often it doesn't, the pace of change is glacial and the amount the law is prepared to move is minuscule. And I think the last, uh, the last aspect of how do we evaluate law is this question of from whose eyes should we evaluate law. If we're going to say that law should be evaluated based on how it's interpreted, implied, and experienced, from whose perspective? So we used to believe, with a straight face, that law was not made through anybody's eyes. That it was, in fact, merely the inevitable conclusion of reason. <laughs> this is obviously false. <laughs> and we now accept that common law judges make law, and that lawyers participate in the making of law. Lord Reed of the United Kingdom Supreme Court once said, there was a time when it was thought almost indecent to suggest that judges make law. They only declare it. Those with a taste for fairy tales seem to have thought that in some Aladdin's cave there is hidden the common law in all its splendor, and that on a judge's appointment there descends on him or her knowledge of the magic words open sesame. Bad decisions are given when the judge has muddled the password and the wrong doors open. But we do not believe in fairy tales anymore, so we must accept the fact that for better or worse, judges do make law and tackle the question, how do they approach their task and how should they approach that task? And so this raises the question of when a judge is applying a law, from whose perspective are they considering a right? From their perspective? from the people who created the Constitution's perspective, from Parliament's perspective, from the majority of society's perspective, from elites within society's perspective, from a minority group's perspective, 
or often, as many law students will tell you, from this myth mythical reasonable person's perspective. But what is reasonable and what is the correct perspective can mean different things to different people. And this quote stems out of uh, after the, the riots in Ferguson. Uh, it's an op-ed by the deans of Harvard Law School and Yale Law School who argue that law establishes its legitimacy through procedures that are open and fair. Legal procedures create accountability for those who wield power. And then the important part, we ought to determine the law's legitimacy, at least in part, from the perspective of those who suffer its coercion. And this is where my research attempts to come in, or, or where the, the thinking that I'm doing attempts to come in, which is, if a judge wants to consider law from the perspective of those who suffer its coercion, where are they going to get information that can help them with that process? Hold on to that thought as we flip to happiness. What is happiness? How is it measured? We seem to know it when we see it. This image brings a lot of happiness to me. I associate it with happiness. It might not for you. But how can we measure that in a meaningful way? such that we could uh, provide useful information to a judge on the perspective of another group or person that he or she has no, uh, 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 no reference or knowledge of. There's three main ways that happiness has been conceived. Hedonism, uh, the work by Aristotle, and this notion of informed desire theory. There's others. Uh, I'm skipping through them. The hedonistic conception is this I feel good idea right now. I'm quite pleased. Uh, uh, I'm not suffering pain. Uh, uh, I've got a lot of my family and friendly faces in this room, and I feel pretty good. I just had a cookie. Um, <laughs> and I like cookies, and so I'm happy. The second conception of happiness is more complex. Under this conception, uh, happiness is not even a, 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 a moment by moment state. It's more of an end goal. It's an objective for life. It's this idea that when I look back at the end of my life, I want to look back and say that I flourished, that I maximized uh, what I was capable of, uh, but crucially that I did it in a virtuous way. Uh, and what's interesting to contrast from the first two is that this second one has this notion of externally derived definition of what is acceptable behavior to, to produce happiness. Whereas the hedonism one is just what happens to make you happy in the moment. The flourishing one comes with a constraint, and that is that there, are, there is certain behavior uh, that you should not derive happiness from. So the object is to flourish and be happy when you look back at your life, but to do so with virtue. And then the last conception is this idea of informed desire theory, where armed with full information and rational decision making, you make a decision of what you want and you get it, either in the short term or the long term. I don't spend, to be honest, too much time thinking about these conceptions in my work. I actually think that most people have some combination of the three. Some people will be more heavily weighted towards hedonism, depending on their age or personality. Uh, other people will, will be more interested in form desire, while other people will be more concerned with virtue uh, and flourishing in the eyes of others. What's been fascinating about this research uh, is that some of those conceptions fall away when you begin to ask people themselves what makes them happy. So rather than uh, providing the definition, just asking them. This initially merges in the field of economics. So following Bentham, this idea of how do you measure utility or utility often substituting for happiness 
and economics d developed this concept of decision utility. That we measure utility by watching what people purchase and then if you're willing to spend five dollars for that cookie it must have given you five dollars of utility. This has been the dominant approach to measuring utility in, in, until very recently. This idea that people will, will reveal their preferences by their purchasing decisions. One of the problems with this approach is that people are not always rational. Uh, so there's many situations where people will do things uh, that don't actually make them feel good and yet they're still buying uh, the gambling ticket even though they have an addiction to gambling. So uh, the revealed preference will say, well, that person derives $5 of, of uh, utility from that purchase of the gambling ticket. In reality, they're addicted to gambling, and, and this is not good for them, either in the short term or in the long term. So in the 1970s, uh, we get some pushback against decision utility and some proponents who say maybe we should just ask people how happy they are rather than trying to use dollars to capture uh, what they're feeling. This spawns this field uh, called behavioral economics, at least in part. Or I should say it's an extension of behavioral economics. And occurs at the same time that this subfield of positive psychology is emerging, which says we should examine the human mind based on the traits of happy people rather than the traits of unhappy people in its most uh, simple form. Um, fr from this, we've developed three ways or three methods for measuring experienced utility. All involve asking people to tell you how happy are you right now. So the first, uh, uh, the most original, was uh, life satisfaction surveys. And these say just what that question says. Taken all together, how would you say things are these days? Very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? You can have a variety of ways of phrasing this question. You can say rank it on a 0 to 10 basis. You can ask them multiple questions. We've been doing this for about 60 years. I obviously haven't been doing this for 60 years, but uh, it's been done for 60 years in a variety of countries, and we now have uh, a pretty rich body uh, of, of information on these surveys. The problem is that it asks people to look backwards and look forwards in assessing uh, how happy are you these days. Uh, and the psychological literature tells us that people are notoriously bad at looking back and looking forward. What they're actually good at doing is telling you how happy or content they are in the current moment. And to get at this, uh, this experience sampling method was developed. Uh, originally this was very expensive, so it wasn't used very often. Uh, and this would be you hang a portable electronic device uh, around your neck and you say, uh, how happy are you now? What are you doing? How happy are you now? What are you doing? And you would do this uh, all day long. Uh, <laughs> I'm annoyed with this device <laughs> right now. Um, more and more information is being gleaned this way. So anybody that has a Fitbit or a running app on their phone or any other variety uh, of electronic information where it says, how was that run today, Ben? Was it, was it uh, uh, awful, okay, really good, uh, and where were you running and for how long? A and then it also knows my age and my weight and where I was. Uh, from this, we're getting a rich body of, of data, both privately and publicly, of what makes people happy in particular moments. And the third was a way that tried to split the two, which was to ask people to reflect in a journal at the end of the day uh, on what made them happy. And I think the key thing uh, to note is that th this science of happiness uh, then attempts to verify. Uh, so how do I know that you're as happy as you say you are? You could be lying or you could be misled. Uh, and so they, they look for verification in a variety of ways. So they'll ask third parties. There's good information to suggest that intimate partners 
will say uh, that Ben is, I would say Ben's a seven right now. That often corresponds with what the actual respondent will say, so that's one. The second is that with the advent of neurological imaging, which wasn't around, so prior to in very recently, uh, people either had to lose part of their brain deliberately or by accident for us to discover what was going on. So they lost that part of the brain, and then we could say, oh, that part of the brain uh, governs this task. Now, with MR MRIs, we can literally capture images of somebody's brain when they're receiving a reward, buying a lottery ticket, losing something, any task that you can do within the machine, I can get an image of, of what's going on in your brain. So we can verify uh, whether or not people's responses are consistent with brain activity to some degree. And then the third way that these responses uh, are, are checked is through physiological indicators. So things that uh, we might widely agree are indicators of happiness, things like how often is the person smiling or how much are they smiling. And the bottom line is that this research is getting pretty good uh, at capturing people's uh, expressed or experienced utility. It doesn't yet allow us to compare, to say, well, Ben's very happy is consistent with your very happy. It doesn't answer a question like that. But it, what it does allow us to do is we could take everybody in this room I could have done this, I could have given you a clicker, how happy are you right now? Depending on what other information you are willing to give me, I could then do a statistical analysis on your income, on your sex, on your age, and look to see if there's factors that are generally associated uh, with your experienced utility. So some of the questions that uh, this subjective well-being research attempts to get at are what factors are generally correlated with increases in subjective well-being. The answers shouldn't shock you. Uh, an adequate income, a healthy body, a loving family. These are the types of factors that generally hold across Canada and indeed around the world. Other types of questions that we could ask, what events positively or negatively impact subjective well-being? What is the magnitude and duration of that impact? So uh, we could try to test a particular event, say a catastrophic injury or winning the lottery, and then say, how happy are you now? You just won a million dollars. And then every month, I'm going to come back to you and ask you, how happy are you now? Uh, and see, uh, what we'd expect is that that million dollars would make somebody happier. But does that last forever, or does that disappear over a certain amount of time? The fourth question is this idea of, are we born happy or sad, or can we change that over time? Are we stuck at a baseline of happiness, or are there things that we can do uh, to change our perspective on happiness in ways that will last and not dissipate over time? I'm not going to get into this too much, but there's, a, you know, there's an ongoing debate uh, uh, with people in both camps. It does seem that there's some evidence uh, that there's lots of evidence on the neuroplasticity of the brain, which is its ability to, to reorganize and change over time to create new pathways and to reorganize the way it works. And there's some initial evidence coming out uh, on, uh, for example, people that meditate regularly are able to change their brains in ways that are, are lasting. Uh, whether or not that corresponds to uh, uh, long-term changes to their subjective well-being remains to be seen. And then the, f the final question is, is really the one that interests me most, which is, are there counterintuitive insights that can be gained from subjective well-being research? Things that a judge wouldn't say that the reasonable person would be aware of. So if you were attempting to uh, apply the law from the perspective of somebody else or from this perspective of the reasonable person? Are there things that you would miss because 
the way you think people operate is not how actually how they operate. So to give some examples or to give one example, most people who suffer a catastrophic injury, something like a paralyzation, uh, will return in not that long of a time period to uh, the level of happiness that they were at pre-accident. Whereas most of us would think that would be the end of my world if I were to experience something like that. Or we would weight uh, that level of loss very highly. What actually seems to occur is a much, uh, a much lower impact on their subjective well-being. And it seems that we often uh, overestimate uh, the positive impact we're going to get from something like winning the lottery. And we overestimate the negative impact that we'll experience from suffering an event. This then has useful purposes for other areas of the law. For example, uh, if I've injured you and paralyzed you, this idea of pain and suffering damages that in the US uh, has been multi-millions of dollars. In Canada, it's much less. Does this notion, or, or could we take this uh, actual information on how, negative, how long the negative impact lasts as a way to quantify how much pain and suffering somebody's experienced? My area is constitutional law, so I'm mostly interested uh, in how this area of research could be applied to constitutional cases. I just want to start with three uh, other people's perspectives, people that suffer the coercion of the law. And the first one comes from Desmond Cole's essay, The Skin I'm In. I've been interrogated by police more than 50 times, all because I'm black which appeared in the April edition of Toronto Life. And he talks throughout the essay about his encounters with the police uh, in Ontario and, and uh, his experience of that. And he says, as my encounters with the police became more frequent, I began to see every uniformed officer as a threat. The cops stopped me anywhere they saw me, particularly at night. Once, as I was walking through the laneway behind my neighborhood pizza parlor, two officers crept up on me in their cruiser. Don't move, I whispered to myself, struggling to stay calm as they got out of their vehicle. When they asked me for identification, I told them that it was in my pocket before daring to reach for my wallet. If they thought I had a weapon, I was convinced that I'd end up beaten or worse. I stood in the glare of the headlights, trying to imagine how I might call for help if they attacked me. So this is one person's perspective on how they experience the law, in this case, uh, police-citizen interactions. Another, uh, this quote comes from uh, the most recent person to receive uh, assisted dying in Ontario. And he says, Physician-assisted death is a right of human dignity, and I'm thankful I no longer have to live under a cloud of stigma and shame that I feel as I slowly and painfully lose control. He goes on to say that his only regret is that he had to wage a court battle in his final months to fight for this right to die. And he says, my hope is that our government will see fit to make permanent changes in the law so that no other family will have to do this ever again. And the last quote comes from somebody who's experienced chronic homelessness. She says, homelessness doesn't feel very good. You feel frustrated and everything is totally useless because you have nothing. The more useless you feel, the more useless you become, and it becomes an ongoing circle. And what I'd like to suggest to you uh, tonight is that the law can and should respond to these types of subjective experience. And if you accept that, the question is then, how can the law respond? And my answer is that I think that this body of subjective well-being <coughs> research that stems from the science of happiness 
could be used to create what I'd call an evidence-based constitutional law. That is, it provides a way to take people's subjective experience and apply it in courts in a way that's not arbitrary, in at least three ways. Uh, and I can give you the, the, the bottom line conclusion, which is there's glimmers of hope in some areas, uh, movements in others, and, and no movement whatsoever in some areas. So there's three ways that we might see this, this information coming into a court process. So the first is, what does a particular constitutional right mean? And this came up uh, in the most recent case of, of Carter in Canada, uh, where the Supreme Court of Canada struck down uh, the prohibition on physician-assisted suicide as unconstitutional. The court was asked, or, or the application was that uh, this prohibition violated people's rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. So this raises the question of what does a particular constitutional right mean? What does the right to life, liberty, and security of the person mean? In dissent, the Chief Justice of British Columbia said that he accepted the argument that the right to life protects more than physical existence. In his view, the life interest is intimately connected to the way a person values his or her lived experience. The point at which the meaning of life is lost when life's positive attributes are so diminished as to render life valueless is an intensely personal decision which everyone has the right to make for him or herself. This is this idea that it's how each of you uh, determine your own happiness that should receive recognition and protection in the law. This part, at least, is completely rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, but what they do say is that uh, there is protection to be found uh, in the liberty and security of the person prong of Section 7 of the Charter. And they get there by saying that what underscores liberty and security of the person is this notion of dignity and autonomy. To which, if you were Bentham, you would say, you've just replaced two words with two more words, uh, which is, is his, his whole point is, uh, you've used two words to replace two other words. Have you really moved the ball down the field at all? And I would say, yes, they have. If you then look at, how do we understand the contour of human dignity? And so one, one way to understand dignity is by resorting to the science of happiness research and by saying, can this research help us measure what impacts dignity? Can we use these processes uh, uh, to measure dignity? Can we measure the change uh, in somebody's well-being uh, when they're in a situation where they don't know how they're going to die versus when they have control over how they're going to die? Is this a question to which uh, we can answer whether or not that has a positive impact. I think it is one uh, that we can. So I think that there's space there to take uh, this social science evidence and use it to help the court define what dignity means in particular circumstances. The second place where this might arise is uh, how do you know that you've got the most appropriate constitutional standard or test or that it's set uh, at the right level. And here I have to say uh, I am uh, a little bit discouraged. So if you were to look at uh, the experience of carding or stop and frisk uh, that has been going on in the US, I think uh, there's lots of evidence to suggest that repeat minor stresses result in a cumulative negative impact on people's well-being that we wouldn't normally uh, uh, think might occur. So if, if you were to say, I would be annoyed if the police stopped me once or twice this week, it doesn't answer the question uh, of what you would feel if you were stopped 50 times in one year. But this science of happiness uh, research could answer that question in a way that is not arbitrary. So rather than having one person say, uh, I'm really bothered by this experience. You could actually say, 
this is a normal way that human beings respond and it has a significant harm. Only Ontario has implemented any legal uh, protection for carding. We don't know how it's going to work yet. Uh, we do know that the police are going to be required to provide explanations uh, to the people that are stopped. They're going to be required to tell them that they do not have to provide their IDs, that they don't have to participate with them, and that they can walk away. They're going to be required to maintain uh, uh, statistics on their stops based on sex, age, race, and neighborhood, and to report on those statistics. But what's distressing, I think, to me, so this is a, a, good, a good first step, I would suggest, but what's distressing is that the public safety minister has said, quote, this is about building safer communities, and I don't think anybody can put a cost or price point on that very important fundamental value of our society. My problem with that is that it ignores this sentiment. It ignores this expression of somebody else's uh, uh, how they conceive of their well-being, and it, ex it ignores uh, this neg negative impact. It turns it into a safety question rather than a question of whether or not the law is actually recognizing and protecting this person. And then the final area, uh, not to end on an unhappy note, but I will, um, is this idea of determining what is a reasonable limitation of a right in a free and democratic society. So as you may or may not know, Section 1 of the Charter uh, allows the government to provide a justification for a breach of somebody's rights where they can show that it's a reasonable limitation of a right in a free and democratic society. And that's usually a three-part test where they have to show that their law is connected with its purpose, that it limits your rights to the most minimal amount that it can, and that it's not uh, uh, grossly disproportionate in the circumstances. So I think here is another place where we might be able to actually say, uh, look, we have a way to measure the negative impact or the positive impact of this law. You ought to take that into consideration, at least for, for cases like homelessness, uh, and essentially every attempt to, to uh, incorporate some response to poverty, those have all failed and been ignored. So we see movement in some areas, such as the right to die, where we're using notions of well-being to define what <coughs> dignity means. Uh, in other areas, we're not quite prepared yet to recognize people's subjective experience. So I think I'll stop there and happily answer questions or criticisms. <laughs> Maybe I will use the Scratic method. <laughs> yeah, at the back. Well, maybe I can kick things off by like starting with your major premise. Where do you get the idea that this research is scientific? <laughs> I think I said it was a social science, uh, for one. Uh, so your, your, your question is, is, is uh, how reliable is this information? No, what I'm saying is that it's not a science. And the information, since it's not a science, I, I, I take it you're, you're trying to ultimately look at a situation where the results of this kind of research somehow or other can be applied to the application of the law. Correct. Okay. And I guess what I'm saying, first of all, it's not scientific. And secondly, it's, it's too broad. And it would be really dangerous if you tried to pull this into interpreting the law and applying it. Right. Okay. So in response, I would say we don't use science very much in the law. When we attempt to apply concepts like the reasonable person, the question is, is this better than what we currently do? So if, you, if you're a judge on the bench and you're attempting to say, uh, this is what the reasonable person would think, 
this is what the repeat reasonable person would believe, this is what the reasonable person would do, now this is what the law is. There's no science in that determination. My question is, or, or my attempt uh, is, can we use social science to actually understand how the people that are most affected by the law think, feel, act, respond? And if that information is accurate, I see no reason why it cannot at least be part of the adjudication process. Otherwise, what you're left with is uh, nine, usually white, usually old judges saying, this is what the law is. There's no science in that process. There's no reference to other groups of people who are the people that experience the coercion of law. It's just what those nine think. And so if you're satisfied uh, with constructing a legal system in a way that has nine people tell you what the law is and that's what the law is and it's from their perspective, then we don't need to change anything. That's what we currently do. But if you want something more, if you want to say, you actually have to be able to tell me why, that per why this action uh, is reasonable, justified, in a free and de democratic society, then I don't think uh, it's unreasonable to, to take into consideration information that we might have on how people experience the law. Yeah? Kind of a, along a similar line, you seem to be suggesting that adding science to law would create improvements and would be somehow contribute to happiness, but I'm wondering if it at the same time would reproduce oppression and deny people their subjective happiness. So keep going. Um, so I, I particularly when you made the point of assessing people's claims, financial rewards or compensation, and perhaps creating an equation based on the science. Um, I'm thinking of things like residential schools. <laughs> and so whether or not the science itself could be oppressive. Um, by denying somebody the right to say that their, their rights or happiness has been trampled on by the law in some way, and that's unjust, yeah. regardless of whether or not the science would actually support them. Yeah, no, it's, I, there's a real, uh, the weak point or danger that's there, and I agree with you, is that uh, you have to belong to a group of a certain size before there can be any information there to validate your experience. That already is how uh, uh, the law functions. If you come and you say, I have this unique experience, they will say, but a reasonable person uh, would not think or act that way. So I think it does give some space uh, uh, to protect people, but it, you're right, I mean, it does run the risk that if you're the first person uh, to, to profess that perspective, you might lose. It goes back to what you said earlier in your introduction as the law being a mechanism for supporting the status quo, right? And so if you bring science into it, as well as being a way of reinforcing the status quo. Um, I guess the two together could in some ways conspire to deny people their subjectivity, which is really what ha happiness is really. So this is a, probably a part where I would part ways. Because I think what happens currently is that y if you come with that unique perspective, you lose. That's the end of, that's the, end of the court case. If you come armed with some uh, amount of evidence to suggest that uh, you belong to a group and that your perception uh, is, is reasonable, then you might win. I can give you a concrete example. It's one I often use with people, and that's of battered spouse syndrome. So if you've uh, killed your spouse in self-defense, uh, the test for self-defense is that you have to have an imminent risk of, of grievous harm or death, uh, from whose perspective do you judge that? 
the leading case struggled because the test is normally the reasonable person. Uh, and this person is saying, but I perceive the threat in a different way because of my circumstances. And you're absolutely right that if it's the first person with nothing else that makes that argument, he or she loses. However, at some point, with enough evidence, you can say, actually, my response is consistent with other people's responses. Not everyone, but enough people that I demand recognition and a legal change. And at that point, you might get it. Yeah, no. You can go. So does that mean that you would have to always have some measure of statistical significance in order to have an argument be weighted? It, it does mean that you will have to belong to a group of a certain size, yes, before there's going to be any support. So but then what about the theorists or legal minds that we draw on earlier? Those people currently lose in Canadian court cases <laughs> <laughs> on a regular basis. So can you see it come to a place where, as this person indicates, that you don't need to have the statistical evidence to have a body, this group behind me to validate my... my yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think that then is a, circum uh, a question of circumstances. So it's a relatively easy case, and this is the first 30 years of charter jurisprudence that I think we've gone through, of where there's no battle between two people's rights. It's just one person's right. And you're, you're attempting to, to fulfill, as Pierre Elliott Trudeau said, uh, that person's right to the utmost. That changes uh, when we start to get into a situation of clashing rights, which has happened more recently. Uh, and at that point, you, need, you do need some mechanism to say, uh, you know, the general public's uh, safety of not having squeegee people on the street outweighs their right to uh, ask for money or their speech rights. And it's at that point that I think uh, this notion of the individual goes out the window completely. I think those are the tough, the tough constitutional cases are ones that pit groups or the public as against other groups or specific groups. It's not, uh, it's, it, it's not a terribly difficult case from my perspective if there's no clash at that point. Then you try to maximize uh, uh, the right um, as much as you can. It's what happens when, when uh, there is some clash. So other. Yeah, that's the heckling section. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, my question is about the difference between dignity and happiness. Right. Because happiness is not a word that appears in our charter. Nor is dignity. Pardon? Nor is dignity. Nor is dignity. Yeah. But the courts have moved to read in this idea of dignity and the interpretation mm -hmm. of different kinds of rights, equality rights, and seven rights. Right. So, from your analysis of happiness, you've chosen happiness as the concept of what is the, what's the addition, what, what additional does this concept of happiness add to the existing conception of dignity that we already sort of are beginning to embrace as a way to measure? Right. So I guess my, uh, where I'd like to see this go in this future, in the future is, are there aspects of dignity that are as, as counterintuitive as, as what the subjective well-being research has shown? Because I think what has been really interesting about the happiness research is that we all think humans respond one way, but in, in actuality, that's not how we respond. So my, question, my, my uh, curiosity is, is dignity like that? Can, we, can I say with uh, the f sufficiency required in law, which is not scientific <laughs> by any means, but can I say uh, that, I, that I'm certain that that person's dignity uh, has been diminished or enhanced? How long does that impact have to last? 
Do you have to say, I was really annoyed by the police in the moment? Does it have to be a last a week? Does it have to last two weeks, four weeks? Uh, where does that, uh, how do you know that the person's dignity has been impacted enough to amount to a constitutional violation? And I think for that, uh, it, it might be possible to, to use some of these methodologies to actually unpack uh, what dignity means. Or if you get uh, somebody who says, my dignity looks different than your dignity, uh, then, then you're in a situation of whose dignity reigns at that point. The majority's conception of dignity or somebody else's conception of dignity? Yep. Um, um, what I'm taking from this is that you're looking for law to be more of, or at least the implementation of law, to be more of a process or a series of ongoing conversations with almost no action. And that if we, if we, if we accept that, that they, for example, dignity is an important legal concept and you accept that dignity means one thing for this person, one thing to me, and one thing to this person, and that's all going to change over time, then you're looking for judges to be hosts of conversations as opposed to absolute decision making. Right. It's this notion of procedural justice that what people want is, and what I would like to see, is actual consideration of, of, of a group's experience uh, and, and either acceptance or rejection based on transparent and, and clear reasoning, uh, which is not necessarily something that we currently do. Yeah, at the back. Why happiness and why not distress? Because it seems to me that all the examples you've given are people who are under some sort of distress. Yeah. And as a sociologist and someone who has engaged in some of this kind of research, um, I think trying to measure distress would probably be easier right. than trying to measure something as abstract as happiness. Right. Uh, so some of it is governed by uh, what if you want to do longitudinal research, as you know, you're governed by the questions that people have asked for the past 60 years. So you're stuck with this notion of life satisfaction, even if you personally would choose to rephrase uh, the question. But I think the other thing comes from the fact that I do comparative uh, constitutional research. And if you go to other countries, uh, you get this real notion that the purpose of the, the Bill of Rights or the Constitution is to build something. It's not just to prevent distress. It's bigger than that. It's to build the type of society that we want to live in. It, it, it has a dual function of, of, of enhancing and preventing the, the, the diminishment uh, of, of or stress, as you put it. So I think the stress probably makes more sense or distress makes more sense from a Canadian context, but might not as make as much sense from a South African context. And that's probably why I've looked for something that can explain uh, both this uh, positive aspect of a constitution as well as its, its negative protections or its negative rights. Yeah. I have two questions. Yes. Okay. First one is more theoretical. And it's something I've been struggling with since I found out that you were doing this topic. So you can explain it to me now. Um, what is the difference between your argument and just expanding what we already protect or may come to protect as positive rights under, say, Section 7? So what's the difference between your argument and just making Section 7 incrementally bigger, as we have done over the last 30 plus years? Do you want to tell me your second question, too? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is a boring one. It's just practical about what the evidence would look like in a case that is applying more theory. So would you have the happiness researcher provide an affidavit and be qualified as an expert? Or would you have the individual provide evidence of their own subjective well-being or both? Right, so I'll answer your, uh, your second question first. Um, and that's that when you look at constitutional litigation in this country, you've seen a massive expansion of the record yeah. in ways that uh, if you were just to go back uh, you know, even 15 years to say, is somebody's security of the person engaged uh, when their child's at risk of seizure by children's services? It was a three-paragraph affidavit 
and the court accepts that as sufficient evidence that yes, some, somebody's psychology is impacted by the threat of their kids being seized. If you fast forward, currently, the cases that win usually have 10 to 20 volumes of evidence in them, good or bad. Um, so I would say you never want the, per the individual applicant's voice removed. Their message should still be there. But the struggle then is, is this an arbitrary response that this person's complaining about? Or is this uh, a non-arbitrary response? Are you asking for constitutional law uh, to be shaped, uh, as this person saying, in a unique way? Or are you saying uh, that there's more to it than that? Because if it's just a unique way and there's a, a, a really good uh, public policy objective for the infringement, then you're probably going to lose. So I think, um, I think the practical uh, answer to your question is that there would need to be uh, uh, expert evidence. What we currently do is we ask third parties to provide that perspective, doctors, sociologists, uh, uh, psychologists. My complaint is that that then takes a, so my infringement only uh, uh, gets recognition if the doctor says so. Not if, not, if it, not if I say so, not if 10 people like me say so, or 1,000 people like me say so. It only gets recognition if this other professional mediates that message. And I think that's uh, part of, of, of what I'm trying to respond to. As far as the difference between positive versus negative rights, it could really go both ways. So you say, um, more Section 7 rights right. would do. So we have the right to die, okay, yeah. check. We don't yet have a right to a basic income. Right. So how could your theory work or are they so I think, ideas? I think you want life, uh, liberty, and security of the person to capture the thing, the needs and aspirations that are most important to Canadians. And if, if there are uh, certain components that it's not capturing, than it ought to. And it, that doesn't necessarily mean that they win, but it has this process-based conversation where you can then begin to say, is the infringement justified? Is there rational connection? Is, it, is there minimal impairment? Is it proportionate to the infringement that's taking place? Right now what happens is we say, uh, we don't even want to engage with whether or not your homelessness leads to stress which leads to early death. We don't, we, we don't even want to hear anything about that. Uh, and so we're not prepared to even have this transparent conversation about, yes, we accept that uh, this social structure means you'll die early, but that's OK, because we live in a free and democratic society, and that's justified. Instead, we plug our ears and, and, and uh, ignore, essentially. So you could get to the same place. Yes. Right. And that actually matters to people. So uh, there's been some really interesting, uh, so most of what I talked about tonight is about uh, uh, happiness and how you currently feel in response to events. There's been some very interesting research on uh, procedural justice and happiness that, that people actually uh, will accept results if they feel that the process was fair has nothing to do with uh, the results. So there may be ways that you could actually uh, orchestrate some things that we're already doing uh, without changing that it's taking place. So the police can stop you, but they have to say, I'm stopping you because here's the explanation. And here's a card saying it. And maybe that, maybe that changes somebody's response. But questions? Yep. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to come back to this idea of dignity. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I think it can become problematic where you have it only referring to things like concepts about happiness. So you have one group saying, you know, I'm unhappy because my religious rights have been infringed because I have to pay for birth control for 
women, I don't believe that we should do that. And so I think it can have these perverse effects if you only focus on that to the exclusion of social context. Do you think that, that, that that's something that was with you right yeah. up until the the, 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 the very end of your uh, I mean, your question. I think if you look at Section 15, dignity is being used in different ways throughout the test, and it's not always a good thing. Right. Right. So it's sometimes problematic, and I think that infusing it with this idea of happiness sort of kind of takes out the social context a little bit, where it has the possibility to. So uh, I don't think that uh, happiness is the be-all and end-all. Um, I'm not saying that you can reduce the charter to one section. Everyone has the right to be happy and leave it at that. Uh, it's really interesting to, uh, this somewhat avoids your question, but from a comparative perspective, so the German constitution has a right to dignity in it. Uh, you only get to use it if what you're complaining about is not captured by another right, so a concrete right. If, if, if what you're complaining about is not captured, then you can go to dignity. Um, but I don't know if it removes the social context as a way as provides uh, a, a way to have a conversation about what the actual interests are in a given court case and why they are important and why a judge might not understand why they're so important to one particular group because he or she has never come close to that person's shoes in their entire life. It's a thing where you have clashing interests, like two different groups, both groups represent representable and statistical interests. Right. 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 They'll probably change the test when that comes <laughs> for the fourth or fifth time. <laughs> yep. Uh, I also want to ask about dignity. I'm going to take a long way to get there. Okay. Um, the punchline now, I guess, is going to be um, maybe we should be skeptical that research about subjective well being uh, can settle some of the most important questions about how we understand the idea of dignity. But uh, I guess I want to take you back to the slide where you're talking about three big conceptions of happiness. Um, you would. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the, so the one that kind of pops out for me is that Aristotelian conception of happiness. It would. A conception of happiness <laughs> where uh, happiness is not really about how I feel. It's about perfectly objective facts about how I like it. Right? And so that, that's something that I think is not really ever going to be captured by MRIs or any kind of social psychological subjective well-being research. Right. Um, and, and yet, that's like a really powerful normative tradition that informs our thinking about lots of really, really thick normative concepts like dignity now. So that there's at least some people in some contexts who think when you think about dignity, um, it's, it's, it's nothing about how I feel, or it's nothing about how most people feel, and it's nothing about what's happening in my brain. It's about facts about my life. Um, and if that's the case, and if those sorts of disputes are at issue in a case like Carter, and I don't know if they are, but if they are, that, that kind of like different ways of thinking about dignity in that way, then uh, I guess like how much, how much mustard is cut by Lots and lots of research about subjective well-being. Yeah. Okay. So, I think the light, the thing I like about this is it, it displays the the philosophers not to pick on you, but uh, <laughs> love for intuition and belief that the facts about my life can be discerned in an objective way that says those facts about my life are indeed the facts about my life, and that somehow at death's door you'll be able to look back and say the facts about my life are this and those are concrete uh, uh, and you get it right um, or you don't um, and so the question then is still how do we get even if I were to accept what you're saying uh, how do we get from the blackboard 
down to the judge who has to say whether that person's dignity has been infringed by this law. Uh, now, we don't have the facts of life at the end of their life yet, so I have to determine uh, whether or not that person's dignity has been infringed, and I'm not in their shoes. So I'm looking for, I'm either going to rely on my intuition, which has been a disaster for some groups in Canadian law, to have judges rely on my intuition uh, of the facts about life, uh, because uh, it completely ignores this other group. Um, or you can say, is there other information that might be of use to me? I and mean, it's not perfect. And does it mean that it's going to spell out dignity with the clarity we might like? The answer is probably no. But is it better than the judge operating without that, that information? And I think the answer is yes for that. And, and, and to win the argument, we have to go for, I'm not going to say this on camera, yeah, we have to go for more beers. But, um, but all I have to do is do better than what the current judicial process is um, to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you have any thoughts on the concept of certainty in the, in the law and the value of certainty for society? And is there a danger to your approach in terms, as opposed to looking at things from the reasonable person standard right. uh, as to what everybody can expect the, the outcome of the law will be, as opposed to looking at it from a subjective happiness approach of, of how will this make? How will this make me feel? Uh, or how will this affect the feelings of the person? Yeah, it definitely has negative, a negative impact on certainty. So I would say that if you can predict how a constitutional case is going to be decided in Canada with certainty, then then uh, I have a cookie for you, uh, <laughs> because that area of the law, at least, do, does not seem to be rich with certainty. Other areas, maybe so, um, and, and uh, maybe it's not a useful tool in all areas of the law. But there's lots of places uh, where the law uh, attempts to employ a reasonableness standard with certainty that's pulled from one person's perspective with no justification of why this other person's perspective is used. And yeah, that creates certainty to say, that person's perspective governance, that's what the reasonable person standard is. But it doesn't answer the question of whether or not why we've picked that person's perspective and whether or not we've picked the right reasonable person's perspective. It kind of goes back to what you said at the very beginning, but a certain type of person goes to law school and we have certain values in our legal system. And things that came to my mind were certainty, predictability, stability, tradition even. Right. right. So your theory, I think, has to acknowledge that it's upending a lot of the bedrocks of our common law system. I acknowledge that I'm yeah. attempting to upend a lot of the bedrocks <laughs> <laughs> of our system. And why a lot of us walk through these doors. Like, we like the road. Yeah. We like the pomp and circumstance of it all. We have time for maybe one more question. Are you not also then arguing that not just the legal system has to walk this path? But the whole political governance system has to work on that as So we have to actually write law, which is a political job, and not a legal job, in a way that takes into account the increasing pluralism and the increasing different understanding of well being. Yeah, no, I think that uh, the legislature uh, needs to consider its impact, the impacts of its law on a wide variety of groups, and it needs to show. Uh, demonstrably that it has considered those impacts uh, and why it's chosen to reject. And I think uh, this has real, real benefits for pluralism. Pluralism doesn't mean that everyone gets to win necessarily. But I think what we're seeing uh, is a variety of groups in Canada and around the world that don't feel like their perspective is being heard uh, before it's being rejected. And that's leading to uh, uh, some very dangerous circumstances in some places. I, th I think on that, I'll just end. And thank you so much for joining me tonight. <laughs> <laughs>